Welcome to the Core Connections Podcast on YouTube. Hey, I'm Erica Zeal. I'm a nutrition coach, Pilates instructor, fashion worker, mom of three, creator of the Core Rehab Program, Core Athletica, instructor training programs, and the Nocta Fitness Membership. And my Core Connections Podcast is designed so that I can help share information with you to help improve your quality of life. So tune in to this episode. Welcome everyone. So today with me, I have David Lasandek. He is a member of the Allied Health Professional Staff in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is a structural integrator and fascia specialist at UPMC Center for Integrative Medicine. And he specializes working with people in chronic pain, pre and post surgical issues, physical performance enhancement and treatment, for those suffering with cancer. So David, welcome. And he is also the author of, see if I can find it on my screen here, um, one of my new favorite books called Uh (laughs) What It Is and Why It Matters. So we're going to dive in today and talk more about one of my favorite topics, which is fascia. So those of you listening, I'm sure you've heard me mention fascia before. It comes up a lot Um, in conversations of all sorts. So welcome, David. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Erica. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so I know we're going to have some fun topics of conversation Mm -hmm. today. And I actually would love to just start with having you talk a little bit about what you do. Obviously, I mentioned your your bio, but um, Mm -hmm. kind of a combination of what you do and then how that probably helped inspire you to write this book. And one side note before we dive into that quick is that this book, you guys, it's for everybody. It's not just for those of you that are, you know, nerdy fashion people like me that are constantly wanting to dive in deeper. You do such a good job, David, of really making it fun to read. So for anyone that's like, I don't know, is it going to be too sciencey? Like keep an open mind. That's one thing I want to tell everyone today is just keep an open mind. Let's get ready to learn and dive in a little bit deeper. Well, th- thank you very much, Erica, because that's that's exactly what I tried to do was to, to write something that was as scientifically accurate as we could possibly make it and accessible to everybody. Well, um, I work at a Center for Integrative Medicine, uh, which uh, the integrative medicine movement, there's about 80 departments affiliated with university or research hospitals. So that's where you find uh, fascial body work like I do. That's where you find acupuncture, chiropractic, uh, different types of psychotherapy and mind-body type medicine, as it's sometimes referred to. So I get to work with a broad spectrum of people, uh, everything from chronic pain to joint replacements to scoliosis, which is a particular specialty of mine, and so on. So my my focus is on the connective tissue system, otherwise known as the fascia. So for those of you who are looking to have a, an easy understanding of fascia, it's a it's a covering. It's a, essentially a sheath that goes around every muscle in your body. It also covers every bone, every organ, and every nerve. So it keeps everything interconnected, but it also keeps everything separate at the same time. But it's one tissue, and it's one system. Um, And that system is designed to respond to supply and demand. So if my skin is fascia, and I'm always pulling on it like this, see how my skin kind of pulls up away from my hand? If this was actually fascia, that would fill in with collagen over a six to nine month period. And then that part of my hand would just look like that. So it's designed to help support whatever we're doing with our bodies. But as we know, accidents, injuries, surgeries happen. We also don't always do things with our bodies in the best way that we could. So sometimes we wind up developing our own problems uh, while we're trying to do the things that we enjoy or love or think, think that are good for us. So, um, so that's the medium in which I work. So, um, so in essence, if you think of from a muscle and bone perspective, if the fascia is an envelope around the individual muscle, if we go in and change the shape or help alter the shape of the envelope, then the muscle inside the envelope can function better. Love it. So to pause you really quick, I pulled out one of your quotes, um, which, and and I've talked about this some, but I I wanted to pull directly from what you said, and it, it is... Quote, perhaps it is time to start rethinking the way we think the human body is structured. And I love that saying that you said somewhere throughout your book because it Mm -hmm. really is about instead of looking at just the bones and just the muscle origin and insertions, which those like myself that went to college, exercise science, you know, we did all the anatomy, we did all of that. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I know I have a lot of fitness professionals that tune in um, and are very curious about fascia and collagen and that and, and that whole world. Um, but I feel like, um, and I clearly obviously know that you agree 100% because this is what your book is all about, is when we start looking at the body as fascia, then it's like it opens up this whole new world of possibilities. So I love how you talk about your integrative you know, medicine that you do. And I think that's a big piece that I want our listeners um, and watchers to understand is I always say like, if something's bothering you, like keep looking for somebody else that can help to serve your body better versus like surgery and things like that, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so one good, one good litmus test is what I find very often uh, experientially in the clinic is that the, what people come in complaining about isn't necessarily the source of the pain. Um, so if, uh, if, if I've got, let's say a deltoid, uh, that's really hurting me every time I go to lift, um, and I go to see a massage therapist or a trigger point specialist, or maybe even a chiropractor, cause maybe there's a neck thing involved. And after one or two visits, it clears up, then that's fine. If it's not clearing up, then it probably isn't any of those things. Uh, and it's more likely to be a fascial situation. If I have somebody coming in with their shoulders like this and they say that they can't turn their head and I say, relax your shoulders and they go, Oh, well, I didn't know I was doing that. Well, then that's probably not fascial either because if, if, if it was fascial, they would not be very easily able to drop their shoulder like that. Cause the collagen, which is the tough stuff that holds thing in place would have built up more collagen there to, uh, maintain that shape and maintain that posture. Gotcha. Okay. So, yes. I think there was more that you wanted. What was yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So I wanted you to talk and dive in more about like what, what motivated you to write this book? I know it was quite a labor of love. M- money. No. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, yes. I knew there was a bestseller in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, I was very fortunate in that I got to... I was kind of at the epicenter of, of all of this research and exploration as it was blossoming. So uh, I'm sure uh, many of your listeners are familiar with the anatomy trains model of Thomas Myers. Um, so I got to work with him very early on in, in that phase of his career, shortly after the book was published, uh, taught with his organization, went into the cadaver lab with him. Uh, that association introduced me to Robert Schleip from Germany. Uh, who is one of the most esteemed researchers uh, in the science of fascia. That led me to Thomas Finley, and and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So along with being in this clinic and really wanting to understand better what it was I was doing, why it seemed to be working, what the mechanisms were, because I'm working in a medical environment. So... um, you know, uh, so I need, I, it's just the way my brain is. I need better answers, but also the kind of people that I'm, I'm interfacing with and that I want to have the professional respect for need better answers than just, and then magic happens, you know, uh, and the body heals itself. Um, we need something a bit better than that. So I was taking everything that I was learning from science land, bringing it back into the clinic and saying, well, what if? Well, I know this and I know that. So what if this person comes in with this problem? I try that. So over the course of a decade or so, I I was building up quite a lot of of knowledge that to me seemed obvious. Uh, So I assumed it was obvious to everybody. Uh, I'm realizing it was not so obvious to everybody. um, And that's okay. And that's okay. So it began to dawn on me, you know what? I, I need to figure out a way to put this together. And I happen to know the people um, who uh, run the publishing company, Handspring Publishing, who published my book. And we were talking one day, and they were talking about how they needed a book just like the one I wanted to write. Perfect. So it's not very often the universe goes, Wah! and it was, here's this book you wanted to write, and here's the people who want you to write it. Now go write your book the way you want to write it. So it, it really was... Um, it was a product of just being in the right place in the right time, having the desire and the motivation. And then, you know, basically, um, uh, actually doing it. I mean, it, it just, I still kind of wonder how it happened myself, but it's something I dreamt about probably for over 10 years. Meant to be. Right, 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 right. But you still got to do the work even when it's meant to be. Absolutely. Um, 
So I, yeah, so that, that's kind of the story of how the book came together. And, and I wanted to, you know, fascist suddenly starting to become a buzzword. It's finally, it's, it's, it's finally getting to that tipping point now where people are going to start to know what that is, that it's a thing, that it's not fascia, that I'm not talking about facial. <laughs> uh, I got that for years. Um, so I also, I wanted to get in front of that because, you know, when something gets popularized, and I'm sure you've seen that with various exercise methodologies, Erica, um, it gets watered down Yeah. and well-meaning people pass on inaccurate information. And I thought if we could put a book out there that puts all the basic stuff that we know in an understandable format, then we have no excuses for that. Correct. I love so. it. That was the other motivation that I had. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful. I'll tell you, I think I pre-ordered it or I bought it right when you had it out. And I sat mm -hmm. down one Saturday and I read it from front to back. <laughs> nice. Yes. Nice. I've read Thank it again you. since. So, you know. Um, <laughs> I, never get tired, I never get tired of hearing that. That's great. That's it great. is. It's wonderful. And for me, because I like to geek out on fascia and movement of the body, and I see a lot of the the connections as I call them through my programs as well that I'm always talking about people are like what connections are you talking about and and you know in general it's it's okay well it's like improving the fascia and the flow of the fascial connections through your body like you say it's one right it's all connected um okay so one thing I want I want to first start off with talking a lot about this mind body connection I know you're very good at talking about that and that is something that I feel um, you know, there's so much power. We talk about the mind-body connection, but mm -hmm. it'd be really fascinating to hear you talk more about mind-body connection as it relates to fascia, you know, in particular, um, because that's something that I have noticed, um, you know, when I'm teaching someone how to better connect through their deep core, for instance, because that's kind of really my specialty and getting the energy to flow better. Um, that it also can improve other things from a mental perspective, and that's that awareness, right? The visualization. So what, what have you noticed when you're doing that? What have you seen improve that you wouldn't think just improve from working on the deep core? Um, you know, okay, so there's this power that I've believed in, the visualization. And so when I teach, when we break it down and we just take fitness in general, mm -hmm. right? One thing I've always done a lot of and has been kind of like my – my bread and butter that I really teach is I'm really, really big on cueing. So I might make someone really take a step back and like, no, we're going to break this movement down, whatever it is. We're going to focus on what you're actually feeling, how you're actually moving. And it doesn't always happen right away because it takes time, right? Right. right. But when you also, I'm also encouraging someone, okay, even if you don't feel it, but you start to visualize what it is I'm telling your body to do, it starts to happen a little bit. Quicker. Okay, so, so, so here's something you'll, you'll appreciate. So, so part of what I do when I'm doing the hands-on fascial work is I'm not, just, I'm not just doing unto the body, but I'm working with you as an individual. So let's just say I was working on your quadriceps. I would have you slowly you know, bending and straightening out at the knee while I'm doing my manipulations so that you're actively stretching. I'm adding compression at an angle or shear, but we've also got the brain and the nervous system engaged. So we can get as much of you working on this at one time. I, I had a very debilitated person uh, once who had a terrible, terrible psoas problem. Okay. Uh, they were in their early 50s and using a walker. And there was no overriding diagnosis or physiological reason for why this had to be so. And I can remember, it was probably the third time we got together, um, <clears throat> I, I, I had my hand on her psoas. And I told her to just imagine that she was raising and lower. I just, I wanted to see that leg work. I wanted to see her actually be able to engage the psoas. So I told her to just imagine it, see it in her head and darn if it didn't start happening after a while. So the power of that, using that visualization with a strong stimulus that reinforces it, that's something that absolutely has a place in the therapeutic or in the exercise uh, rehab relationship. Yeah, so I know there's like there's the power in the touch, but it's also that just telling someone to connect. So are we doing something from a like I know you talk about, and you're gonna have to explain this a little bit. Um, I feel like I understand it, but <laughs> if we say the word okay. the word glia, I right? It. Like we talk, you talk about glia a lot and yeah, the I microglia, do. and mm -hmm. um, again, something that did I learn that in college? No way, but it was long enough ago, right? That all this stuff is way way newer. Um, does 
by doing that, are we improving? And I want you to explain also what glia is, but because um, it matters. It matters that we have glia in our brain, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. That may be the next book, Glia Matters Too. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, I wrote it as, I wrote it down, Glia, explain what they what it is and why it matters. Let's see, there's your next book title. <laughs> Uh-oh, I think, I think you're going to get me off on a whole, I'm going to have a whole brand yeah. that blank, what it is and why it matters. Yeah, so, um, but in a nutshell, right? So can you explain mm -hmm. to everybody the purpose of Glia and, and in a sense, um, because the smarter, the more intelligent brains and like the mm -hmm. research that's out there on say an animal mm -hmm. versus a human brain, right? Humans have more glia. Can we right. actually create more of more glia by improving that mindfulness, improving the fascial energy and function of the body? Um, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if we're not. Okay. So let me, let me, let me rewind that a little bit. Uh, so that everybody listening can follow us right now. Okay. So, um, just as you have, um, cells called fibroblasts that are responsible for maintaining your fascial net, um, and they respond to supply and demand. There's this other class of cells in your brain and, uh, in your peripheral nervous system called glia, G L I A. And, um, they were discovered at the same time neurons were discovered. Uh, but the neurons were bigger, they were easier to see, and they were thought to be more important because size matters, obviously. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the glia were relatively uh, ignored, uh, rather like the fascia and connective tissue was relatively ignored. So even though it was abundant, it was just assumed to be less important, uh, just like the fascia was thought to be the stuffing um, in the body, the insulation and the packing peanuts, the glia were thought to be the insulation, the stuffing and the packing peanuts of the brain. But it was only within the last 15 years that we've seen that glia do communicate to each other. And they seem to be responsible for not just for maintaining, uh, healthy neuronal connections, but they also seem to influence which neurons fire and which neurons don't. They even seem to regulate how, how we breathe, uh, in terms of uh, by constantly monitoring the pH levels in the body and increasing respiration. So glia are incredibly important to our autonomic functioning. And there is the potential, um, well, I want to go back to what you said actually, Erica, too. So if you look at the glia to neuron ratio, you, you may have heard that old thing that we only use 90% of our brains. I'm sorry, we only use 10% of our brains. I use 90 because I'm awesome. <laughs> But um, we only use 10% of our brains. And I remember hearing that as a kid and going, that makes no sense. If we don't, why, why would we have all this and not use it? So that was one of those things that really bugged me. Well, it's curious to me that the neuron to glia ratio is one to nine. So for every one neuron, you have nine glia. Okay, so there's your 10%, there's your 90%. So somebody did the math and said, well, we're only using 10% of our brains because 90% of it are these other cells and they're not the neurons and the neurons do everything. So maybe not so true. Uh, but as you go through the, the animal kingdom, you find that the more sophisticated the organism like us, we have a much higher glia to neuron ratio. So lower forms uh, of animals will have fewer glia to each neuron. Um, they actually did an experiment where they took human glial cells and transplanted them into the brains of rats and made them smarter. That, that that freaks me out. <laughs> I was like, Neen, that's weird. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I'll tell you, I, I didn't mention the book, but I have written to them and said, uh, what happened to those rats? Right. Are they, are they running the lab now? And they never answer. So like, once your experiments were done, what, what happened to those rats? What did they do? Did they build condos? What did they, because, um, but so it's interesting that there seems to be a, there seems to be an association between the glia the amount of glia and the relative sophistication of the brain. And the most interesting thing that I've come across in, in all of my glia research, which I've been doing since 2004, and when I say research, I mean trying to read and understand everything I can about it. I don't mean that I'm actually doing glia research myself, just want to be clear, um, is that um, the area of Einstein's brain that was responsible for um, visual thinking and higher mathematical functions had a much higher glia to neuron ratio than average. So if we had nine to one, uh, in general, in those areas of his brain, uh, he had 27 to one. Otherwise his brain was completely unremarkable. 
So that's to me that that to me is an interesting relationship that would be fascinating to study with greater depth. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping because I I have to tell you, Eric, and I'm glad you brought this up. I uh, I get a lot of comments on chapter five, and that was that was like my baby. I love every chapter in that book, but that one's really my baby. So I'm hoping that some of these glia scientists are going to get a hold of this book and go ooh 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 ooh, and they're going to start making connections. Yeah. Uh, that maybe they hadn't thought about before. And who knows, maybe 10 years from now, that chapter will be completely different in the third edition of the book. I think it will. I And, and I feel like we're going to come back to that. I have some questions relating to brain, but I feel like we need to talk about some more stuff because it's sure. so... Hey, this, so... Is, this is your podcast. You're in charge. You just <laughs> tell me where you want to go and I'll take the car there. Okay, so we're, we are going to come back to that conversation. But before we do, I want to talk more about fascia and our immune system and our lymphatic system because this is something where right we have the visualization and awareness of the body and movement and all of that right we know there's power in that well what about the power being in as people start to connect better with their body from a getting the fascial getting the blockages out of the different spots of the body because they're more aware they're moving their body like specifically again i teach the deep core stuff and one interesting thing that has come about, and I haven't, it's one of those things where like, I wish I could do my own like research study. Um, but like, for instance, I've, <laughs> I've got a couple, I've got these amazing groups of women um, mm -hmm. doing stuff from prenatal, postpartum, beyond, pre, and all this stuff with the core. And I see something interesting with my core rehab women that a lot of them have autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. A lot of autoimmune diseases. Um, and one interesting thing that has come about is, uh, again, in trying to get get all this feedback is, is challenging, but um, is that they're seeing a huge decrease in their symptoms of autoimmune disease. And we're not just talking like MS. I'm talking like a lot of it's like the Hashimoto's and things like that. And there's obviously mm -hmm. a whole array of autoimmune. But I see, I see the same thing. And I'm not doing exercise physique. I'm not doing what you do, but I'm doing what I do. And I see similar things where people who come in with autoimmune disorders change or improve. Uh, in that, and that's that's a secondary effect to the work that we're doing. Obviously, um, I've even seen it with people who are recovering from Lyme, which I find incredibly exciting. So are they yeah. already like they're starting their Lyme recovery, whatever that looks like. I know that can be very involved. But they're seeing yeah. you for manual work, right? And with yeah, and with that, they have to wait till they've recovered enough where they're not depleted by the treatment. Not because the treatment is so painful, but just but it takes energy. Yes. If I'm if I'm working on your body, but you're also working your body in particular ways to assist what I'm doing, that takes a certain amount of effort and energy, and Lyme can be very depleting. But I've been amazed at uh, the changes that I've seen autoimmune wise in those circumstances. So. Not across or not with every single one, but with enough of them. Enough of them to see that there's something happening. There's something going on yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> so to break that down, right, when we look at fascia, because it's full of all these fibroblasts, right? So can you explain to everybody the purpose, like fibroblasts do what for the body? Mm -hmm. Well, fibroblasts are a type of cell, and they basically, they're responsible for generating and maintaining everything between the cells in your body. So um, we think of our body as being very solid, but uh, there is an interior scaffolding that's made pre predominantly out of collagen and elastin. So the collagen gives it its sturdiness, the elastin gives it its stretchability. Um, ground substance, which is a, a thick liquid that can be harder or softer depending on where it is in the body and various different cells including T cells, mast cells, telocytes which are cellular communicators um, and these fibroblasts. But the fibroblasts are responsible for maintaining this whole inner framework of organization for all of your muscles but all the way down to the cellular level. So that's what they do. Now in terms of the autoimmune function Erica and this is stuff that's not in the book um, because it's too new. Okay. But, um, so, uh, you probably read the article and some of you are probably familiar with that. Oh, maybe about two months ago, two and a half months ago, there was that big thing about the new organ that they found. Okay. Right. Now, what did you think when you read that? Well, when I first thought, I was like, that's not new because I'm familiar with <laughs> the Russia. And, yeah, yeah. and right. I listened yeah. to So we all had that same reaction. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And here's the thing, the actual paper doesn't call it a new organ. So somewhere, some writer was trying to get clicks and went, oh, 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 it's a new organ. And then everybody just picked up with it and rolled with it. But there's nothing in there. What they were really looking at is the superficial layer of fascia, but they were looking at it in a way because of the kind of staining they were doing. Uh, they were perceiving what they were seeing in a way they had never seen it before. So they called it an interstitium. So basically, the interstitial space is the space between your cells. It's the space between your skin and your muscles and organs. So rather than it, they were seeing this interstitium is a continuum through which the lymph and other things, and basically the, the intracellular water of the body flows. And that space is, is full of more loosely organized collagen. That can become stuck and tacked down. Scar tissue is an excellent example of this, where that interstitial fluid uh, has to make a detour around it. So sure, I think if we, if we free those areas up and loosen them up, that's going to improve, you know, all of the, the microcirculation of the body, and even more so, just last week, Helen Langevin published a study um, uh, that had a very interesting result. So they took rats, and for those of you who like rats, I apologize, but they injected them with breast cancer tumors. And they had two groups. They had rats that just did their own thing, and they had another group of rats that they stretched for 10 minutes a day. And basically, they figured out how to put them on a little bar and stretch them like this, or put the put them down here and stretch them like that. But the whole thing is they wanted to stretch through their forepaws and into where the, the chest area is on the rats. And they worked out a way for them where they could hold that stretch for 10 minutes. Uh, and in this, in no way, distressed the rat. They actually liked it. What they found was that two weeks later, the they measured the tumor growth rate. In the group that stretched, they had a 52% reduction in tumor growth rate as opposed to the rats that didn't stretch. That's fascinating, which tells you that, yes. that the stretch. So talking about autoimmune, immunity, inflammation, mm -hmm. can I throw inflammation, um, the topic <laughs> of just inflammation in the body, um, kind of in the same function, because I feel like so much our of our immune function can be like mucked up by inflammation, which can affect mm -hmm. be affected by like what we call the interstitium, right? Things not flowing correctly, the fluids. So by stretching, we're actually opening up and creating more fluidity through the fascia. So yes, you can mm -hmm. probably say that even better, right? <laughs> uh, well, potentially we are because they because they got to use it. I mean, you can. You, you can, uh, you know, you can lead a person to greater core strength. Um, I can free up a struck deltoid, but if they don't activate that when they're not with us for that hour, uh, they're not going to maintain that. Um, but what happens is if I, you know, to put it in, in, in you probably see that too. Um, so if I have somebody with a range of motion problem and I get them from here to there, What's going on on a cellular level is every time they use that greater range of motion, they're sending a signal to these fibroblasts that say, oh, we want less collagen here because we want more movement here. Maybe we want more collagen there because that's where we need our support now. And the fibroblasts will adapt and create different enzymes, both collagen building and collagen eating enzymes. And that's true whether you're exercising or whether you're doing anything else. So that's also why it's super important that we we sit and we stand and we do the regular movements on a day to day in a in the position we want our body to stay, right? Because if we're always in that shrugged up like this, well, that's mm -hmm. where that collagen is going to go, and we're going to build up that to kind of keep us in that. Versus right, exactly. And that's more. nine. That's a nine to sixteen month procedure, by the way, just for everybody out there listening right now to really get the thing where this is my shoulders now. That's like you know eight hours, ten hours a day. I work at computers. I go home and relax on Facebook and video games, kind of thing. And I never play basketball, or I never go to Erica. So, so the 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 collagen the collagen uh, turnover cycle in the body uh, has a half life of about six months. So, at about six to seven months, about fifty percent of your collagen completely turns over and builds new cells based on how you're using your body. Uh, there are some areas where it's thicker, like the IT band, where it might be closer to six months, sixteen months before it gets more of a full regeneration of all those collagen cells, and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned IT band. That was one of my questions. I want you to explain to everybody why we it's 
to not directly stretch an IT band and how we need to work mm -hmm. around that and, and the reasoning behind that. Because I still get people, and I'm always promoting, like, okay, your IT band's tight, that's a response to something else. Yes, yes, good. I knew I'd like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the guy who was like, Man, I have this IT band syndrome, so I've been rolling it every day for an hour for a month, and it's not better. And I'm going, oh, oh. I know. <laughs> That's probably why it's not better. Um, the IT band. Okay, so let's let's actually take a step back. So, college, your your fascia, the collagen in your fascia has a weave to it. Okay, so um, for those of you familiar with nylon hosiery or pantyhose, it kind of goes the the weave of that hose goes at an angle like this and so on, and that gives it a lot of pliability, but it also gives it a lot of strength, so you can stretch it without ripping it. That's kind of what your fascial net is like in your body. It has a 55 degree angle weave that gives it that resilience, okay? Now, your IT band's a little bit different. The collagen, 98% of the collagen fibers in your IT band run parallel. They run in straight lines, and they run straight up and down, okay? Down the length of your leg. Do you know why? Because we are on two legs. There is not another creature on this earth that has an IT band. We're the only ones because we're meant to stand up straight. That's why it develops that way. So the idea, one, of stretching your IT band, eh, I don't know that that's really ever going to happen. Um, and indeed, when I treat the IT band now, I don't really worry about, I don't really think about treating the IT band as a whole. I play with the edges to the forward part along the quadriceps, to the rearward part along the hamstrings, to, to, to get it sliding better on its, on its downstairs neighbors. Um, I've given up the idea that I'm really stretching it out. Now, is there a rehydration potential in terms of squeezing uh, the connective tissue out along the IT band so that it can uh, take in more intracellular water? Sure. But the experts in Germany say to do that, it would be about a millimeter a minute that you'd have to use your foam roller. So incredibly, incredibly slowly. Yeah. So with the like the fascial releasing at home, the trigger point, the foam rollers, slower is better, and then even slower is better, and sometimes mm -hmm. even going gentler is better. Yeah. If you if you gotta make this face, then you're probably doing it too hard. And you know that's a good point, and I, I learned that from my dear friend PJ Eau Claire, um, is that different areas might need different rollers or different thicknesses or viscosities of rollers. What, what roller I might want to use on my forearms, because I work with my hands all day, it's not going to be the same roller I might want to use on my quads or my IT band. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we get... So you say this a lot to people, don't you? Yeah, there's yes, the IT band one still comes up a lot, and I'm I'm constantly saying no, we have to work around it and all of that. Mm -hmm. But there's you know the great thing I love about all those tools is that it helps for people that don't have the resources to be able to go to a manual therapist and things like that. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And 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 you know one of the one of the things that I love about being a manual therapist is if I'm doing my job right, my point, my job is to put myself out of a job. So, um, unless you're uh, the person I saw this afternoon who um, literally broke his neck, and it's amazing he's not paralyzed. Um, hmm, I have no idea how long he and I are going to work together. Uh, he's made a phenomenal recovery. I've, I've known this guy for quite some time. He's been a patient of mine off and on for years. But under normal circumstances, uh, I'm going to see somebody anywhere from five to a dozen visits over uh, a period of three to four months, maybe 16 at the outside, and then they're going to go away for six months and they're going to live their life and then maybe come in for, for a checkup. So um, a good manual therapist, when it comes to the fascial body, realizes that there's a stopping point. There's a point where it's like, okay, we, we've met the goals and now go and, and you know tell your friends. So uh, that, that makes it, I feel, a little more scalable. I like the idea of a therapy that has a beginning and a middle and an end. Okay. Okay, so just putting that out there. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. It's uh, because I think for so many, it's it's about being able to function pain free in your yeah. right. Yeah. That, that's and 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 the thing is, whether it's and, and I tell this a lot because I'm a big uh, I prescribe a lot of yoga, and um, what I will tell people is, you know, if, if they're if they're going to if they're going to yoga, if they're going to you, if they're doing something like that, they may eventually get there, but if they go to uh, somebody like me, they're going to get there faster. So I can get in there, help them find it, 
open it up and make it mobile, and then they go to you and you show them how to use it even more effectively. And I find the catalyst of those two approaches is is better than either on their own. That's just my own personal philosophy. For sure. There, there's nothing that's, you can't beat that one-on-one -on -one manual work with an amazing therapist just hands down because you get to pinpoint and work on the specific. It's really a customized program. One thing, um, and we can get this afterwards, but um, I know you talked about there's like 80 different integrated medicine facilities across the U.S. I would love to have that list for all of our listeners because I feel like so, so many people find me because they've got, you know, the back pain and the pelvic floor issues. And while what I teach is obviously super helpful, it is never bad to go to someone. So I'd like to put that link. Yeah. That we and, okay, um, I'll, there'll be a link in the show notes yes. for that. And, 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 and there are a lot of there are a lot of little clinics that are called integrative medicine clinics. They may not be affiliated with a hospital or a university. So when you're shopping, uh, please watch out. I've seen some that are basically uh, nothing more than plastic surgery places. So it's 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 a name that, that, that sometimes gets misappropriated. But there'll be a link in there for the the professional organization that kind of um, <clears throat> you know you got to pay your dues and, and meet certain marks to get in the door. So you should be safe there. Ah, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, back to our conversation. Ba yes. Yes, I know. So so um, so we're talking about autoimmune um, and the immune function. And I want to circle back um, with what we were kind of initially talking about, like the brain function, the brain body, mind connection, and the fascia and the glia. Now, what are your takes? And we can theorize this and just, you know, okay. be blatant that maybe there's no research out there. Um, but we talk about, you know, like things like Alzheimer's, dementia. And I feel like, you know, even people when they're in their 20s and 30s, there's so much that we can do at a younger age to really be working towards preventing that because inflammation is such a big thing. And when we were talking about glia earlier, have you seen any correlation between anything with Alzheimer's and dementia with the amount of glia in a brain? Do you know, you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> that, that's a really, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Uh, I have not. Okay. And um, I, I don't know that, I don't know that that isn't out there, but I haven't come across it. What I have come across in on more than several things, uh, more than several instances. And so I encourage you to maybe, um, Google this or go to PubMed and put this in, but ballroom dancing and Parkinson's ballroom dancing and Alzheimer's. So there are these really interesting programs that are starting to come together in some of these integrated medicine clinics involving dance and involving uh, these degenerative neurodegenerative diseases. So that, that's a very exciting frontier. That's very much mind-body medicine. Are the glia involved in some way? Probably so, um, but, but I haven't seen anything that directly speaks to them. So, you know, again, this whole, this whole glia focus in my book <laughs> is kind of uh, a brand new frontier for, um, for, for, for most of the fascial realm and presumably most of the glia well too. I'm just trying to put these two worlds together and hoping that other people literally take the ball and run with it. Something that, that, that I got to participate in, I was at an integrated medicine conference at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and they actually had a two-hour workshop on African dance. Yeah, and it was taught by a woman who uh, had been, um, her family had been uh, victims of racial genocide in Africa. So most of her family wasn't around anymore. So she had a lot of anger, uh, a lot of sorrow, a lot of really difficult emotional stuff to work through. And uh, she did a lot of her self-healing through the dance. But all of those African dances, not only do the rhythms have specific uh, functions, the dance moves have specific energetic functions, have specific emotional functions. And that that resonated with my background in Kundalini Yoga. And I went, wow. So there there was so because their dances are designed to express certain emotions that are hard to express with words, um, she was able to to come to peace with what had happened to her and her family. Just her dance. Just her dance because <laughs> because of the movement and opening up because we hold emotion in our fascia is, is that where you're going with that from the well yeah um there, I know there's, 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 
there, there's a relationship. There's a relationship. Okay. I don't want to say that we hold our emotion in our fascia because that's kind of a, that's a little bit of a mushy statement. Okay. And, um, but it's tension. So when we're holding in emotions that we don't want to express for whatever reason, we don't think we can, we're afraid that our emotions are actually bigger than us and they're going to overwhelm us. There's a physical tension that comes along with that. So, so think, so the next time that you're stuck in traffic or you're really annoyed with somebody on the phone or who's texting you, stop a minute, go in your body and feel the fact that you're physically tense in that moment, even though you're reacting emotionally. So imagine doing that for weeks, months, and years. It's going to etch itself into the connective tissue system as tension, so it should come as no surprise that sometimes when that tension's released, it expresses itself emotionally. Okay, new research um, that I've heard you mentioned, and I wanted to ask if you had a chance to dive in any deeper um, and could explain maybe any more that January uh, research in a nutshell was basically talking about how women that have uterine fibroids have a lack of telocytes, like they have none in their uterus, and versus those that don't have uterine fibroids, they had, it was like a small percentage of telocytes, which... Okay. Um, well, first of all, you need to send me that when we get off the air. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll send you the one about the uh, breast tumor study. Okay. Okay. Read it. Um, well, that that makes sense to me because telocytes are, and, and I have to explain to the audience out there, we only discovered what telocytes were in November of 2016, literally less than four weeks before I turned the book in. Um, so that was kind of exciting to right up to the minute be, be adding things to it. Um, we do know that telocytes are involved in immune function, and we do know that they respond as cellular messengers. So, um, so if we need to carry if we need to carry a message from one cell to another cell to another cell to tell them about what's going on, uh, and give them the news that they need to know so that they can respond appropriately, the telocytes would do that. So the fact that there's a lack of telocytes spreading the necessary information on the cellular level and suppressing immune function makes sense to me that there could be a, a correlation between that and fibroid growth. Okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, how you treat that with that knowledge, I don't know. That's, okay. exciting. That's exciting. So, okay. So, but basically, right, the, it's, does that have some sort of correlation with what we could potentially be could we improve upon that potentially by having a better energetic flow through our fascial system? Because we do know that there is actual energy that can flow through our fascial system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just kind of theorizing here, right? Um, if we get women to better connect through their entire body from a fascial perspective, right? Everything's connected, getting the energy flowing, decreasing inflammation of the body. Yeah. Well, I that think that uh, messages send better. Like I'm really mm -hmm. trying to keep this. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Well, any, anything, anything that is going to help the body communicate better to itself and the person communicate better with their own body, i.e., learn to listen to and understand the signals of the body, can only improve the body in a general way. And there is a specific. Uh, uh, form called visceral manipulation, which sounds lovely, but basically it's just learning how to treat the fascia of the organs. So you might remember earlier on, I was talking about how the organs uh, are wrapped and in sheaths and fascia. They also have ligaments, like our musculoskeletal system does, and uh, and they act as de facto joints for the organs and give them a certain range of physiological movement. If your liver didn't have a certain amount of motility in your body, it wouldn't be very comfortable to do a forward bend and so on and so forth. So it's possible that some of these visceral techniques um, could be useful uh, in these circumstances in terms of getting things to mobilize and function better. Correct. That, that now, what that would do how that might uh, increase uh, telocyte population. I don't know, because we don't know enough about telocytes yet, but uh, it'd be a fascinating study. Interesting. Yeah, so I just, I, I try to look at things on a, how is it all connected? Because we all know it's all connected, right? So now let's talk about, um, when you talk about like, you know, the more awareness of your body, is that what you're referring to interception, which is the... Yeah. Interknowing and awareness of the body, which you talk about it as the seventh 
sense. Am I correct mm -hmm. with that? Yes. Correct. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about that? And then also proprioception, which I clearly know what proprioception is. Um, you talk about it as the true sixth sense. Um, it's something I say it with my clients and the first couple times I say it, they're like, what did you say? You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a big, it's a big chewy word. It's a big chewy word. It's not like, you know, seeing, hearing, tasting, um, you know, and, and, and feeling, and, and, and propio, proprioception, it, well, it isn't feeling. Um, proprioception is feeling where your body is, um, as opposed to feeling something tactilely, like I could feel the computer screen here, and I would get information from that. But feeling where your body is without even having, with, without having to really look at it. So when you adjust yourself in a yoga pose without ever without having to look because you can feel, oh, I need to move my ankle this way. Or if you close your eyes and you touch your nose and, and you hit the target, that's proprioception in its simplest sense. It's the, it's the awareness on a almost subconscious level of where your body is right now. So when you're going down the stairs and you miss a step and you come down hard and you expected to have a step there, that's when your proprioception's a little bit off, okay? So that's an example of anti-proprioception. <laughs> Um, now, interoception is, is, is feeling on the inside, okay? So heartburn is an example of interoception. Um, hmm, my bladder's full and I need to go empty it is another example of interoception. Hmm, something's really wrong down there. Something doesn't feel right down there inside my body. I better go get it looked at or, oh, maybe I just need to do a stretch and then, oh, good, then I'm better with it. And interoception, again, is just another one of those areas that's still relatively new in our understanding of the human organism. Um, one of the more interesting things is um, the relationship between interoception and uh, anorexia. Um, because these, there's been some interesting studies that have shown there seems to be a correlation between faulty interoception and anorexia. So if you give somebody with anorexia uh, a pencil and a piece of paper and ask them to draw a picture, they'll draw a picture of a fat person. So, um, so there is something on the inside, there's something going on in their communication with their own body and how they feel, how they perceive how they feel that is not accurate to the external reality. Okay. Now, can that be worked on by trying to get someone to be more aware of their body, like maybe meditation, just the mind? Uh, they've done studies with yoga. And, and anorexia, and they've proven very, very interesting. I think I cite that research at the end of chapter four in my book. Okay. But I couldn't call it up. I read it. <laughs> yeah. You got it. Look it up. Look it up. It's back. There. Yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. It's, it's, it's a very, you know, again, these, the, these mind-body disciplines that um, is opposed to, they, they focus less on an external, oh, I want to be sculpted and look like that, is to I want to access that and really feel what I feel. Mm -hmm. The power in that too, the power in, uh, in really turning into your body and what your body is doing, um, which it can be a, a challenging shift for someone to make that. I mean, I look at my past, I started more in the fitness industry and I've definitely become more on the holistic realm and really trying to get people to feel and connect with the stuff inside their body. So, so what, I just, what made that shift for you? How did that happen? Um, was it gradual? Uh, yeah, evolution? well, I... It's funny that you are good friends with PJ Eau Claire because I run into her from time to time because I my Pilates background is Stott. Okay, all right. Yeah, through Marathu. So the Pilates definitely was a good transition for me. And then I think as time went and I started having different clients that they'd either find me after or while they'd say go to physical therapy. And then I'd, I'd realize like, oh, well, the physical therapist is missing this whole area. And so it was just a gradual shift. And then I don't remember. Oh, you know what my initial shift to, of fascia was? Was Gil Headley's Buzz video. And I yeah. know I've heard since he's he's redone that. He's, he's working on some new stuff. Um, but there was a shift. When I watched that, I was had this huge aha moment. A lot because of like, people. Lot in of college, people. I didn't, we didn't learn what fascia, and we might have learned what it was, but we didn't really learn about it. It was still all oh, muscle. It wasn't, and, it wasn't important. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's slowly beginning, slowly beginning to change. And that's in, in, you know, Erica, you brought this up. So I just want to kind of drive that point home is that a lot of, um, I'm going to use the word traditional, um, therapies, um, or, or forms of movement and exercise, um, they, they can get a little bit reductive dis and very parts oriented. And the difference in the fascia revolution, if you will, is that it's very whole body oriented. 
And like you keep saying, it's all connected. It is, it helps to know how it's all connected, but then you also kind of have to feel how it's all connected. So I was just teaching a, a fashion yoga class yesterday and what we were really trying to engender in them was not so much, okay, don't, don't feel the part in the pose that's like you feel like it's holding you back from really expressing the pose, but feel that whole line of tension or stretch, you know, from this part of your foot to that part of your arm and extended sighing or, or whatever. But get, get this sense of your whole body in the pose, not just the little parts that you, you want to improve. Um, get, a, get a sense for the big picture mm-hmm. and how the little parts fit into the big picture. And that's what a lot of traditional therapies miss. So they just, the PT focuses just on that shoulder, but you've had that shoulder problem for a year. So your neck, your arm, maybe even bits of your back, they're all going to be involved. So the PT will get you so far, but it won't get you the rest of the way. And that's usually where something fascial comes into play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that explanation. So I want to ask you, um, so everyone can get to know you a little bit more. What are your like top three or so things that you do for yourself personally to keep you moving fascially well or in this realm of holistic health? Mm-hmm. What are your personal things that you do for you? Um, well, I like to get good body work when I can. That's obvious, but, um, so I'm going to, so that, that's, that's the, that's the one you probably already know. So that's not fair, but the three things that I do. Um, yoga. Okay. Uh, and I try to go to a class twice a week. Um, and it's about also finding a teacher that you like, that you resonate with, maybe trying a couple of different teachers. Cause I, I have a strong Iyengar background, which is very postural based, very alignment based. And that feels really, really good. But I've been working for the last three years with somebody whose background is more, um, um, vinyasa and Kundalini. And I find that I really love the combination of the two. Okay. Um, and that really keeps me humming and humming very well. And I'm, I'm doing things. I, I build up strength just in the last few years. I'm doing things now that I wasn't doing two years ago. Uh, and I'm doing them with ease, which is the important thing. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two is acupuncture, which actually I can make the argument is a fascial modality because they've done ultrasound and they've seen that when you put the needle in and you twist the needle, that individual collagen fibers uh, will grasp onto that needle and actually pull on it. And acupuncturists will report when they put the needle in the skin that they actually feel like the skin's pulling the needle down into it. Uh, and now we know kind of how that's happening. So that is that is number two. Number three is awareness. Um, and by that, I mean, how am I using my body and how am I using my body in the moment? So if, if, I'm, if I'm in the clinic and I'm working with a patient, and I start to feel strain or soreness somewhere in my body while I'm working, I need to take a moment without stopping what I'm doing and adjust how I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, because that that straight out, sometimes you do have to muscle stuff. Um, you know, but but if I'm, you know, if I'm if I'm working and I'm feeling something in my shoulder that I don't like, I say, wait a minute, Dave, why are you, okay, put that shoulder down. So it happens to me too. So constantly monitoring myself and making adjustments um, as I find them in the moment. It's why, and you know, I, I stand a lot when I work, which is great because I can do lunges um, uh, when I'm working, but I also use a stool and I use a stool. I don't use a chair so that I have to stay balanced on my sit bones, on my ischial tuberosities so that I may, and I can adjust the stool so my hips are slightly higher than my knees. That's a great that's a that's a great tool for me, but I also have to watch that I'm maintaining my upper body carriage too. Just because I'm sitting more forward on my hips and in my sit bones doesn't mean that I'm not prone to do this by the time I'm seeing patient number eight if I'm not paying attention. So, yoga, acupuncture, good awareness. Ah, wonderful! I love those. One thing can I add on for your with that you? I know you talk about yoga a lot. Um, but just to reiterate with everyone that I have a lot of listeners that that love yoga, but it's about also like bringing the awareness to your yoga practice, to whatever it is you're doing because, and, and you know, your body better than anybody. So I just, Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it at that, but, um, (laughs) that's that's a good place to leave it. But yeah, ideally all of these body mind types of disciplines are really about self-study. So you need to bring that mindfulness to it. Well, thank you, David. And I just want to show his book one more time. My, I've got only one sticky note in there right now. I think I had like a dozen. 
as of last night. But you guys, I will put that in the show notes. And Handspring has given us a code for 15% off, which is awesome. So um, I will put the link for that as well. So if you are a fitness professional thinking about it, you absolutely, this needs to be in your library. And even if you're just curious, this is a great book for those of you that are curious and want to learn a little bit more about your body, mind-body connection, all this fun stuff that we talked about. Um, so thank you so much, David. Is there somewhere else, um, another website that you wanted to mention for them to find more about? Uh, yeah, if you, um, and they'll be in the show notes too, you'll have the one for the Integrative Medicine Centers. If you're looking specifically for my website, it's fashionmatters.health. Okay. So www.fashionmatters. Dot health if you want to get in touch with me for any reason or see where I'm going to be teaching next or, or speaking or whatever. All that information is there. And the other one would be fasciaresearch.org if you want to be like me and Erica and really geek out about that stuff. That's the one to check out. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David, and thank you all for listening. All right. Thank you, Erica.